Hello. Special thanks to Onusaber for sponsoring our 90,000 subscriber lightsaber giveaway. All the details are in the pinned comment down below. Our story begins on Naboo with the dispersing of Palpatine's son. The apprentice of Darth Plagueis was preparing what he would like to believe was his first contingency plan. At this point in his life, he didn't know about the powers of the Force and what could be done with it. He didn't know about cloning or even creating life with the Force, so he didn't tell his master and he had a child with an unnamed woman. And when the child was born, he gave Dathan away to an orphanage and killed the mother. The boy didn't have the Force and Sidious knew that. His hopes were that the child would grow up and have a child of his own who would be picked up by the Jedi. Sidious believed that before Plagueis could disclose his master plan and how he would destroy the Jedi, that his own plan could begin. He had hopes for a future people that would rise to the ranks of the Jedi Order and destroy it from the inside out. This of course happened before the creation of Anakin Skywalker. Down the line when eventually Anakin was brought into the Order at the age of 9, Rey had already been long abandoned by her parents. Dathan believed his father was coming for him, which was true. Anakin, as a 9 year old, was 4 years older than Rey, who was 5 and alone. She hadn't been discovered by the Jedi and she was abandoned on Coruscant. The city was so large and was full of 3 trillion sentients. The chances of Dathan's father finding her here were very unlikely. Rey at this age never knew her family name, as Dathan never openly expressed that he had one. Dathan knew where he came from, and it was through his curiosity that he exposed his family to the Sith Lord. Rey at 5 was stuck in the city of Coruscant on her own and had to figure out how to survive. Luckily, Dathan was kind enough to give to a mechanic in the lower levels named Kryn Rio. Unluckily, Kryn didn't care about her aside from what she could offer as she got older. She could work for food and nothing more. As a child, she wouldn't know any better aside from the fact that she was hungry. Plagueis and Palpatine had a long-time Sith ally named Ochi from the planet of Bastoon. He survived encounters with Masters Depa Balaba and Mace Windu at one point or another, and so he was talented enough to hold his own. Regardless, he brought Dathan and Miramar before Palpatine, but they refused to reveal the location of their daughter, which led to their untimely deaths. Rey would spend four long years with Kryn. He wouldn't give her a place to sleep. He wouldn't treat her like a child, and he showed nothing close to semblance of humanity towards her. Rodians weren't known for their kind behavior by any means, but Kryn had a reputation down here on level 1418. Rey hadn't seen the sun in the four years that she spent down here. Her home was carved out of a burnt home from a gang-related battle. Obviously, the battle ended years before she ever arrived at this dump. By the time she was calling it home, she was hiding and avoiding drunks and squatters. Being a little girl only made this more tantalizing and stressful. When she was five, about a month after she first arrived, she had to defend herself. She used a pipe that was in a dumpster that she was sleeping in. The only reason she survived the incident was because her screams got the attention of a passerby. The person who saved her told her to avoid dumpsters because the worst people of 1418 always go looking into them. It's how Ray found her home inside of the burnt out building. The person also told her to keep the pipe. It could be the difference between life and death. It was, over a number of times actually. Her struggles only continued in between those four years. The scum of Coruscant were always looking for easy scores, and nothing seemed easier than someone who was sleeping. They could take her stuff, or even just take her. She had to learn to sleep with one eye open and keep her pipe, which was replaced at this point with a staff, by her side at all times. Kryn never got any nicer as she got older, and her food portions only decreased, which meant she had to work harder and harder to eat. One day while she was out dumpster diving, she was attacked. Rey was smart enough to avoid dumpsters, but it had been four whole rotations without food, and she was listening to her stomach speak instead of her mind. Dumpsters always had something worth trading in. Not by normal standards, but by the standards the people of this level found acceptable to trade with. Rey got her piece and started for the shop that Kryn called home, until her heels were dragged out backwards out from under her. Not a scream could save her this time. She dropped the piece she spent nearly an hour searching for and walloped the guy who grabbed onto her. She quickly exited the alleyway and she was swooped up by a larger man. In her reflexes, she chomped down on the guy's wrist and he let her go. Ray was dropped to the ground. Had she been an adult, she would have caught herself, but not here. She hit the ground and rolled, getting to her feet as fast as she could and holding her staff in her hands. As she was standing there, the man from the alleyway came out and they pulled their pistols on her. Before they could fire, a lightsaber ignited and the two men turned back to see Nikito, Jedi Master. He used the force and flung their pistols away from their hands and told them to leave. They turned and ran in the opposite direction. Rey looked up at the Jedi and he asked if she was okay. She was still as a statue and as pale as a ghost. He put his lightsaber away and knelt down and pulled out some food from his belt and headed it in her direction. She reached over and grabbed it from his hand as quickly as she could. The moment their hands touched, she could feel the presence of the force within her. She took the food and ate it within seconds and then looked back at him. She said that she'd never seen a Jedi before, and he asked her if she'd be willing to come and see others. She questioned what he meant, and he told her that he was curious about something. She seemed as if she could have a genuine potential in the Force. He asked her if she knew where her parents were. She looked down at the ground and said that they were long gone. 
She did admit that she was hoping they were coming back, though. Imagundi looked around and then back to her. He stood on her level and looked into her eyes. There was a sadness in her eyes. He asked her if she really believed that her parents were coming back, and she smiled and nodded her head. But very quickly, that smile faded into a frown. He could tell, and he told her that she already knew the truth. Ray looked away and wiped her eyes. She expressed with a little more momentum that she believed they were coming back for her. Master Gundy told her that he would take her topside with him. He knew that she had to have the bare minimum midichlorian count to make it as a Jedi. He brought a number of Jedi into the Order in his time, and this experience with her was relatively similar to those other ones. There was a feeling that one would get from a child if they had a lot of Force sensitivity, and she had it. He reached out his hand and asked if she would come with him to the Jedi Temple. Rey heard stories of it, but she had never seen it. She was sleeping when her parents brought her the Coruscant, so she had never actually seen the top side of the planet in her entire life. Rey started reaching out her hand, but she didn't know she could trust him. He didn't move. He was as still as a rock. He just waited. As he waited for her to make a decision, a rodent man popped out from behind him and asked what he was doing. Gundy asked if she knew the man behind her and she nodded her head. He stood up and turned around and asked him what he was doing with her. Kryn told the Jedi that she worked for him. Ima Gundy asked then why wasn't she eating. Kryn tried to make up an excuse and Gundy silenced him and told him that under the Galactic Republic, slavery was illegal. Kryn tried to speak up, but Gundy had already pressed a button on his belt that would call Republic police in the area. It was common for Jedi to have that on their belt if they worked in the Undercity. There were Republic police droids in the area, but they only stayed around their headquarters, which was the only safe place on the level. Kryn tried to run, but Ima Gundy stopped him with the force and waited until a number of minutes passed by and someone arrived. When the police droids got to his location, they took him away. He'd be going to prison for a long time. His operation was as close as one could get to slavery without simply calling it slavery. It was unpaid labor, and the only thing that the laborer received was food portions that couldn't even feed a mouse. Once Kryn Rio was taken away, he turned back to Rey and asked her to come along with him. She wasn't exactly ready to trust him, but this made her feel a lot better, so she put her hand into his, and he walked with her back to the Jedi-issued speeder. As it lifted into the sky, he asked her a number of questions. She answered them, but she didn't really understand the purpose of the questions. Most of them were about her ability to critical think, if she believed she could feel things or see things before they happened, if she could feel people's emotions or even her own emotions more than those around her. She answered yes to a couple of those questions. Not that she would be able to identify what that was, but the main consensus she could come to was that there was always something within her, and she was afraid of it. This did worry Imagun D. He didn't know much about the Council sessions with Anakin Skywalker, but he did know the Council was very displeased with Anakin's emotions. Rey would likely be treated similarly. Though, Imagundi's biggest fear is that she would be rejected by the Jedi. Again, being that he was unfamiliar with how Skywalker was brought into the Order, he just believed that an individual had to have a high midichlorian count to make it in at such an age. As the speeder ascended the levels, Rey looked out the side of the vessel. Imagundi didn't notice because of being in the dark, but Rey was covered in dirt and her clothes were raggedy. The low levels had put her through the ringer, but he was also so fascinated to see her optimism in the moment. Of course, she didn't want to leave behind her home, and she cried because she thought she would never see her parents again. And she held that that pain within her, but there was also an optimism about her. Her optimism about her parents returning to her kept her alive most nights than not. If she didn't have that optimism, she would be dead. She couldn't be brooded or drowned trodden, or she would have died of natural causes alone. She looked up at the sky as the top side of the surface closed in. Her smile widened, but her sense of awe really took Imagundi back. He noted just how rare it was to see someone with such an outlook of life. Her smile rated it as they reached the surface. He turned over and asked her when she last saw the sun. She looked over and said it was when her parents left her. She pulled her arms up and stretched them out in front of her, and felt the warmth of the heat gently place itself onto her arms. It was a paradise. Not that life was perfect or even kind or in the slightest, but the littlest things had to be appreciated for what they were. As they sped over the surface of the city, she could see the outline of the temple forming in the distance. The grandeur size of the city was remarkable. The skyscrapers touched the clouds and amongst the sea of beautiful architecture, there it was. She looked at it as her jaw hit the bottom of the speeder. She turned to Master Gundi and asked if that was the Jedi Temple. He smiled and told her that it was. Her eyes drifted back towards the temple and watched as it got closer and closer to her. The speeder pulled up to the side of the temple and landed. Ima Gundi got out and took her with him as they went to the medical bay. Turns out she was actually quite sickly, mostly due to malnutrition, but that was being dealt with at the moment. At the same time, Ima Gundi ran a midichlorian scan. It was just a reference as to how the Jedi could tell if someone could be brought into the Order or not. Ima Gundi got the results and he was extremely surprised that he took them and then told Rey that he'd be back momentarily. 
She nodded her head and watched as he quickly shuffled to the council chambers. He entered and apologized for arriving unannounced, but he had just brought a girl back to the temple with a high midichlorian count. The council looked around at each other and then asked him to say it. He told them that she had a midichlorian count of 18,000, 450. The council looked to each other and then back to him. They asked if she too was created by the force and he shook his head. He said that from what it seemed she was left here about four years beforehand, and her parents haven't been back since. Truthfully, the council wasn't enthusiastic about this either. They didn't like the idea of another powerful child being brought into the temple. She was an Anakin, considering Skywalker nearly had 10,000 more midichlorians than her. But how could there be two children discovered within the span of four years, with midichlorian counts higher than most Jedi in the council chambers, let alone the Order? Depa Balaba asked if Imogundi could bring her to the room so they could speak with her, as they did young Skywalker. Imogundi told them that he couldn't. They dismissed him, and they began a discussion amongst each other. Mundi expressed that if she was anything like Skywalker, then perhaps they should keep her away from the Order, and it can cause enough trouble with his instructors and his peers. Plo Koon did acknowledge that, but said that Skywalker was now training with Master Kenobi. If it were the same case with Skywalker as it was with her, then perhaps she would be like Anakin. Spend four years with the instructors and younglings and then become a Padawan. Mace reiterated Mundi's point and suggested that if she shows symptoms of the dark side, then they needed to be very wary. He expressed that while Skywalker was meant to be the chosen one, and he had faith that he was, he didn't trust Anakin in the slightest. His point being, if Anakin was the chosen one, then what was Rey? Was she the anti-chosen one? Was she something else? Even Peel expressed that it was possible the late Master Sifo Dyas was right about the coming darkness. If he was, then perhaps she was a later half of Skywalker's generation's chosen one. Maybe it was convoluted, but he did express that it wouldn't be the first time there was an individual meant to help maintain the balance. Opa Rancisis agreed. Rey clearly wasn't the chosen one, but no one other than Skywalker was. That had to be clear since the day they discovered him. But the point that Even was making is that perhaps Rey was an individual meant to carry on the balance once the prophecy was fulfilled by Anakin. It wasn't far-fetched, Yoda agreed. While he didn't believe he was the chosen one, Yoda for most of his life was the Jedi with the highest midichlorian count in the Jedi Order. Most of his mentors did believe he was the chosen one, but it had been a long time since that was actually remotely said to him. Truthfully, Yoda believed that Grogu could be that chosen one, though the notion of the Force having individuals to maintain the balance always seemed right anyways. If the Jedi were meant to work in accordance with the Force, then they were the balance. To maintain that balance, individuals would be brought along to keep it. Mace did suggest that perhaps the Force sent Rey along because Anakin wouldn't maintain that balance in the Force. This notion did leave some concern in the Council. They wouldn't be able to tell, potentially, for decades. Would their decision hurt them in the future? Their discussion carried along back and forth until young Rey was brought before the council. When they saw her, they asked about her family and she said that her father's name was Dathan and her mother's name was Miramar. This was enough to convince the Jedi that it wasn't a couple of their theories. Initially, a couple masters believed that Rey could be Sifo Dyas' child, or even Dooku's, but that clearly was not the case. It was unlikely that a Jedi would leave the Order, have a child, ditch the child, and then let that same child become a Jedi. After Imogundi was dismissed, Mace pulled out a little device from under his seat and asked her if she could tell him what was on the device. She couldn't answer it. Rey expressed that she didn't know much about what was happening. The midichlorian count didn't lie, but there clearly hadn't been some sort of awakening within her. This wasn't uncommon, actually. Sometimes extremely Force-sensitive people needed an awakening within the Force. This could be done through a number of circumstances, such as a near-death experience, a bond with another Force-sensitive being, a mind probe, or just a simple instruction. Rey explained that she didn't know much about anything related to the Force, but she did say that there was something within her, and she didn't know what it was. She was always scared of it, but at the same time, it felt like it protected her. Mace immediately noticed that Rey was similar to Anakin, for the fear that sat within her. Of course that was going to be there. She was an orphan slave, according to Master Imogundi. At least Anakin had his mother. This could prove to be even more negative for her than it was for Skywalker. As a Jedi, the lack of attachments could make her a terrific Jedi or it could, in the long run, be worse for them, just as it did Anakin, but Anakin's longing came from his attachment to his mother, so that may not be the case. Mace was becoming even more and more apprehensive about Rey, and while he didn't say it, the members could tell. They also felt the same way because the fear was that she would be just like Anakin. Yoda asked her if she knew how to reach out with the Force. She shook her head. If the Jedi wanted to know if she was truly Force-sensitive, she needed to take her task in front of them. Of course, midichlorians and so on, but the Jedi Council needed to see it. Yoda asked her to sit, and so she did. He then told her to close her eyes and reach out. Naturally, without ever being connected to the Force, she raised both of her hands. The Council smiled and watched as Yoda got up from his seat and walked over towards her and lowered her hands with his hand. He spoke to her and told her to reach out. How to focus? Rey closed her eyes, and so she did. not She could feel for the first time what the Force felt like. Yoda stood by her side and watched her focus. He then asked her what she was able to feel. 
Rife felt chills roll down her spine as she said that there was some light and, and life. There was peace and destruction, Yoda nodded his head and asked what else there was. She stopped and said there was cold. She took a deep breath and when she breathed out, her breath was visible as if she was inside the temple on Ilum. She paused and told them that there was a darkness pulling at her. Yoda put his hand out and told her to resist the pull. The council collectively could feel Rey dive deeper into the darkness, giving past the light and the balance, and then she fell backwards. She was knocked out cold, and under her body was a crack that left millennia-old floors scarred for the first time since the Order fell during the Old Republic. And they stood up and exclaimed that she was too dangerous to be allowed into the Order. Yoda looked over at the master of the Order and stepped back. Rey didn't move. The jolt from the Force awakening within her just knocked her out. As an adult, she may have been able to hold on to it. As a child, it was overbearing. Plo looked over the council members and expressed that perhaps like Skywalker, she needed proper guidance. Mace turned and expressed in a question of what guidance could fix a child so fixated on the darkness. The council would return to debate, but Rey would be taken to the medical wing until she woke up. When she did eventually wake up, she was brought back to the council to finish her test. She could see the crack in the center and apologized profusely. She didn't know what happened. To many of the council members they recognized as Jump Into the Darkness as Force revealing something that she wanted answers to. She may have known her parents' names, but she didn't know her parents. She wanted to believe that she was a part of a special lineage. She only recognized shadows of her mom and dad, and she only had a pendant with their names on it, but no last name. What else could she do? So the council had her take the test just like Anakin did. Once exposed to the Force, she was able to breeze through that test. It wasn't too hard, it was just simply understanding what was on a small tablet. It only took a little outwards reach. She was dismissed when the test was finished, and the council put it to a vote. They even asked Kenobi about his experience with Skywalker, so far in their training together. Obi-Wan hadn't had Skywalker for more than a year, but Obi-Wan was kind of lying to the council. He wasn't close enough with any of the members yet, and he didn't want to show that he was having struggles. He was trying to prove that he could fulfill the promise he made to Qui-Gon. So he told them that working with Anakin had some ups and downs, but for most of the time, they were just up. This was the last push to squeeze the council into allowing Rain to the Order. If Obi-Wan hadn't lied, she would have been sent back down to the Undercity. A bit cruel, but as is the fate of those unable to be a Jedi. Rey was surprised when she was welcomed into the Order, but she felt like she was under a microscope because of the damage she did to the council chambers. Her first days with the other younglings would be challenging, but there were so many great peers in her classes. She did get picked on a little bit, but compared to what she faced in the Undercity, this was nothing. When it came to lightsaber combat, she visibly struggled here. Anyone who used some sort of staff in their life could wield a lightsaber, but all of her swings looked like Form 7, all jabs. Without her knowledge or anyone else's in the Order, it connected to her grandfather, the prominent Naboo leader of the Galactic Republic. Chancellor Palpatine didn't know where his granddaughter was, and it left him a bit unsettled at the idea. Hopefully, she had his darkness flowing through her. It showed when she used a lightsaber, but most of the time it showed darkness when she was agitated. Rey's primary focus wasn't using a lightsaber, she had a lot of focus on the Force, and she believed that, as her lessons taught her, she should focus on the Force more than anything else. The lightsaber was a fine instrument, but the Force was what she needed to focus on, according to the Jedi. The Jedi would watch over Rey and see the differences in her individuality compared to those of her peers and that of Anakin Skywalker. There was a darkness that did reside within Rey, and it was very obvious, but she also didn't try to hide it. She didn't openly use the dark side, it was just within her. Unlike Skywalker, she was a very studious individual. She wanted to learn, she wanted to belong. While the Jedi hadn't been mythologized in the lower sectors where she was raised, she did want to meet a Jedi at one point in her life, and she loved to hear stories about them. Some of the people that worked for Kryn Ryo told her about the Jedi and the times they had with them or seen them or interacted with them. Rey wanted to be a good Jedi, and so she never interrupted and always paid attention. She did try and go out of her way to learn as much as she could, but due to the restricted section in the archives, she couldn't dig as far as she wanted to dig into the Force. After six years inside the Jedi Order, Rey was finally ready to become an apprentice. She was 15, which was a pretty average age for a Jedi Padawan. Other individuals, such as Caleb Doom, who Rey interacted with a couple of times, became a Padawan at the age of 11, having born in 33 BBY. Ahsoka was also set to become Kenobi's student at 14. Rey was sitting in the age range for the average Jedi Padawan, though most Jedi knew about the nightmare Anakin was for Kenobi, so they were apprehensive about taking Rey. All they heard was the same story. Anakin was an angel at the beginning of his training, and then well became Anakin. This was false. He was Anakin the entire time, but the lie Obi-Wan told was spread around quickly. Not that he lied, but the fact that Anakin just was Anakin. Rey did feel a genuine sense of rejection for not having been picked up by a master yet, but she was okay with it. She was able to feel a sense of belonging within the Order itself, just not with a master. She believed that one day she would find herself a master, or they would find her. 
The one thing that continued to prohibit the growth for her as an individual was her attachment to learning who her parents were. She wanted so desperately to learn, but she couldn't. It required venturing through the dark side to do so. But with the onset of the Clone Wars, perhaps she could learn. Didn't matter. Yoda brought Rey to a training room where Ahsoka was. Rey and Ahsoka were already familiar with each other. They were quite friendly with each other as well. Ahsoka was very talented with a lightsaber, and she was very quick to learn as well. Yoda was sending Ahsoka to Christophsis so she could become Master Kenobi's student. Yoda then turned to Rey, who he enjoyed watching grow over the past couple years, and he told her that she was to become Anakin's student. Rey was genuinely surprised. She heard rumors that Anakin never wanted a student, but maybe that wasn't true. Maybe she would finally get her sense of belonging with Skywalker. Rey's journey over the past six years was an interesting one, to say the least. She loved the art of the Force and she craved knowledge. She read everything she could get her hands on and she was obsessed with the fact that she was a Jedi. To her, it meant everything to be a Jedi. To use a Force, to have a lightsaber. The lightsaber wasn't the coolest thing or the most important accessory to her, but she still loved having it. The one thing that separated her and Ahsoka the most was her skill with a the lightsaber. They were both very quick learners and very talented. One thing that Yoda noticed about Rey in comparison to Anakin is that she was able to refine her abilities much better than he was. Anakin was too impatient. He was continuously trying to be the best and prove those around him wrong. He showed this and he proved it by the way he used a lightsaber, becoming one of the greatest duelists inside the Order at the age of 19. Oh hey, look, it's me. I feel like this is a good time right now to remind you all that this is literally her character. I haven't changed a single thing except for when she was brought into the Order. Okay, anyways, enjoy. Rey, on the other hand, wasn't one of those greatest duelists. She had a form, but it was still a combination of what she used when she had a staff. Most of her instructors of the younglings critiqued her for it, most specifically her jab. Rey used the jabbing motion a lot, and the teachers did not like it. Ironically, the use of her jab wasn't meant to be aggressive, it was just familiar for her. She didn't know how to explain it, but she avoided using it as much as she could because of her instructors. Rey's refining of her midichlorians allowed her to open herself up more to greater opportunities. It was something she learned while observing a duel between two masters. Obi-Wan and Plo Koon both had around 13,000 midichlorians, but they displayed the skills of someone with 32,000 midichlorians. She learned by watching them that to refine the force within oneself was to make oneself the best Jedi they could be. She looked forward to being Anakin's student. Everyone inside the Order knew who Anakin was. A good number of people knew who Rey was too. Without the last name and the midichlorian count as high as hers, she made a name for herself simply by being allowed into the Order, just like Skywalker did. Ahsoka and Rey talked to each other about the war going on around them and how they felt about it. Both of them were apprehensive about the coming war, and because they didn't know how they would react to it when they faced it, they were apprehensive. Neither wanted to be soldiers, but they both believed that they were going to try and bring peace to the galaxy, so maybe that was the purpose. They were happy with that because if that was the answer, it was a better answer than the Jedi being warmongers. When they arrived at Christophsis, both were taken aback. They hadn't seen Skywalker Kenobi since before the Battle of Genosis. Obi-Wan was sporting Jedi mullet with clone armor over his body, and so was Anakin. Though Skywalker's armor was dark, they both introduced themselves to the Jedi who were to be their masters, and Anakin was kind of rejecting the idea. He didn't want to be a master. Also, she was only four years younger than him. They were like the same age, literally. Though unlike Ahsoka, he had heard of Rey before. He knew that the only reason Rey was a Jedi was because of him, and he suspected that they would get along due to a similar response they received from the Jedi Council before they became Jedi themselves. Rey was very quiet, and she was passed off to Rex, who showed her around a bit. He said that she didn't say much to her, and she just shook her head with a smile. What was there to say? She was a student. She was here to learn. He told her that, aside from learning, she'd be fighting as well. She nodded her head, and she also knew that. But whatever he or Anakin said was what she would do. He smiled and told her that she did technically outrank him, but then he told her to always remember, experience outranks everything. Rey smiled at Rex, and they were distracted by an energy field that popped up on the far side of the city. They immediately informed the generals. Ahsoka and Obi-Wan were already beginning what was bound to be a tough relationship, when Rey and Anakin had their first interaction alone. They were standing on a tall building trying to figure out how to go around the droids or simply get to the generator before the droids reached the heavy cannons. The two of them brainstormed for a moment, and then Rey said that it might be old, but they could sneak up the middle. She used to hide under things all the time to avoid Kryn and other thugs in the city. The comment kind of concerned him, but he thought it was a good idea. They would use a small crate, hide under it, until the droids passed, which is what they did. As they did that, they never stood up and avoided running into a destroyer droid. As they got up, they could see the shield generator. They ran into some debris to hide, and they looked at the generator. Anakin told Rey that they had to be careful, and she said, Yes, Master, and he stepped out. And she followed him. Anakin put his hand out, and she walked into it. She looked up at him, and then he pointed to the mines. They were connected to sentry droids. If they were activated, they would set off all the mines and attack them. 
Ray looked at Anakin and asked what they would do. He said they would do a slingshot. She was really confused, and then he told her that he would throw her over there. Simple. No, not simple. Ray didn't understand, and he told her that she just needed to trust him, if it was going to work. Anakin smiled and said, hadn't she ever taken a risk before? Ray looked around like he was out of his mind. No, she hadn't. She survived and listened to the Jedi. That's what she did. Anakin told her it'd be fun and told her to drop the bag and he threw it over to her once she landed safely. She took a deep breath. Time to trust her master. He pointed her back a little and then told her to run forward and jump when she was ready. So she didn't. She ran forward and leapt up as high as she could, and Anakin gave her a little boost, which got her all the way to the shields. Anakin then used the force to throw the bombs over to her, which she was able to catch and set up. Ray then realized, how was she supposed to get back? Anakin called over and realized the same thing. He told her that if she jumped, he'd try and catch her and bring her back with the force. Try? Ray started to see why people had a thing with Skywalker. He never made things easy. Time was already ticking on the bomb, so she used the generator side to launch herself up. But her foot slipped as she jumped. It was alright, Anakin had her, and the shield generator exploded behind her. He brought her back to the other side and he helped her up, and asked if she was alright. Ray started laughing. Anakin was confused, but she expressed that it was a little fun. A little nerve-wracking, but fun. It was a combination of exhilaration and adrenaline running through her that got her to start giggling. It was a little nervous giggling, but the two of them started walking away from the generator. Anakin was glad to see that she listened to his request, but his biggest fear is that she'd become like Obi-Wan or just be too grounded to the code. Though, it didn't necessarily seem like a code thing, more or less her listening skills. It's me again, it's time for another interval. Uh, she trained with Leia for a year, that's canon. Uh, the reason she didn't listen to Luke at the end of her time on Oct 2 was based on the attachment to Ben, not Kylo, seeing a future where Ben Solo was him, so this does fit in with her character. By the way, the next battle would be at Teth, and Anakin would begin to see the first struggles within his student. She was far from a warrior. Trained for six years, yes, but using a lightsaber formed proficiently in battle, no. She was trained as if she was existing in a time where war was not at its peak. Anakin needed to prepare her for war. So when they returned to the temple after the Teth and Tatooine escapade, Anakin watched her training regiments with the probe droids. She was working in front of Yoda, Windu, Plo, and Obi-Wan, who was now in the High Council. She finished the training regiment with an exceptional rate, which the council was very happy with. Anakin was not. He was very unhappy with it, but it wasn't because of her. The test was sloppy. Rey was just far too timid to joust with her master. They had a good dynamic, but she didn't raise her voice at him, because he was an instructor. She was the same way with any teacher she had. She just asked what he would like her to do. He looked away and said that he would train her his way. She jumped at the idea and then asked why hadn't he been doing that. He paused and looked around. Wow, thanks. He told her that he would come up with a test for her and then she would learn. She was eager, and the two of them split off from each other. The conversation was audible, but Obi-Wan and Yoda looked at each other. In the coming hours, Rey would be brought out to a massive warehouse where Anakin, Rex, and a bunch of clones were waiting. Anakin told her that she was going to learn. Rey was confused. Why weren't they at the temple? Anakin told her that the Jedi probably wouldn't approve of this method of training. Rey tilted her head with a grin and asked what she was going to do. He pointed at the center of a circle and told her to stand in it. He said that he knew she wasn't as flexible based off the reports from her days as a youngling, but that would have to change. She would face adversities like Count Dooku, General Grievous, or even go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Asajj Ventress again. Rey cringed. She remembered blocking a couple strikes from Asajj and then being thrown backwards. Rey looked at Anakin as he told her when she was ready. The clones would shoot at her with stun rounds. She would have to protect herself. Rey looked at the clones and she was still learning to get their names, but she ignited her blue lightsaber. She looked around and then ready herself. She blocked three strikes until she was clipped. She woke up an hour later and Anakin asked if she was okay, and she was. Though she was surprised, she was knocked out for an hour. While her next attempt would have her blocking four strikes, the attempt that followed only had two blocks. She was getting more and more agitated the longer it went on. During the final attempt of the night, she got frustrated and used the force to catch a couple of blaster shots that were fired in sequence. She didn't know what she was doing and released them, and the plasma launched into the air. Luckily, no one was hit, but she dropped the lightsaber and apologized for almost hitting them. The clones looked at each other and then the Skywalker. He was even taken aback. Not that he hadn't ever seen the move done before, because he had, but he never saw the darkness rise from within her. It was always there and he could feel it, but she never showed it. Her frustration made it easier to show, and then he realized that this might make their endeavor together a little more difficult. Once the clones told her she was alright and she apologized to her master for acting erratically, they moved on. She didn't know where it came from or how she did it, but Anakin understood. He used the dark side before, and when he used it, he slaughtered the Tusken Raiders. He didn't tell her that, but he did express that he understood how she was feeling and the power that she accidentally unleashed. He told her that he could help her with controlling that power. He had a power, and she had a power just like it. The thing that scared her the most was what that power could become if it was allowed to blossom. 
While Anakin probably would have enjoyed a bit more pushback from his student, he did enjoy that she listened to orders no matter who they came from. Every student had their struggles and she did hers, though most of the time, her struggles came from losing clones. She spent so much time alone that she thought of every clone like a brother to her, and so watching them drop dead really crushed her. Where Anakin's presence on the battlefield was commanding and stoic, hers was soothing and warm. This dynamic between Master and Apprentice helped with the clones as well. It allowed the clones to get the best of both worlds from their Jedi. Rey began to fall into Form 6, though Anakin warned her from using such a form. He said that the form was a solid combination of all the five forms before it. But while it was a solid form, it wouldn't protect her if she came across General Grievous or Dooku. Anakin believed it would work against Ventures, but that's because she could be a sloppy fighter from time to time. Rey asked what she should use then, and Anakin shrugged. It was up to her, so she asked to learn his form. This would be difficult for Anakin to teach her. Not because of it being the same form he used, but the size difference. While Rey was relatively tall for a woman, she wasn't as large as Anakin was. Skywalker could put a lot of emphasis on physical strength while dueling in Form 5, which is why it made him such a nasty opponent. If his speed, aggression, and fury weren't enough to disarm you and disable you, then his strength would. To teach Rey this would be difficult. He could obviously teach her how to be speedy and use what she had back in that form, but teaching her the physical strength was something he couldn't do per se. She could obviously learn it and build to a level similar to his, but that was what was special about Skywalker. But he agreed to teach her in his form, and Form 5 became crucial to her training. The war left permanent scars on those who fought in it, and Rey was no different. Losing troopers was difficult, but she became enamored with battle tactics. She would spend a lot of time with Yularen and Rex. Because she got close to the clones, she would even help Fives and Rex draw battle plans later on in the war. This, of course, was akin to her time with Anakin. She didn't divide it up 50-50. It was more or less when she wasn't spending time rigorously training with Anakin, she was either sleeping or learning what she could about battle tactics. Before I get all the um actuallys in the comments, uh, in the Rise of Skywalker, in her little room on that planet, she had Jedi texts open, so she kind of liked to actively read them, it's in the subtext. As the war got more heated, Anakin had his first fear from his student. Not that he could have ever taught this to Rey, but they were on the battlefield. It was a lost battle towards the middle of the war, and they were trying to evacuate troops. And a duo of clones weren't going to make it out alive. Anakin didn't want to leave them, but they had no other choice. Their position was being surrounded, and the evacuation had already taken place. Turns out one of the men were wounded, so they couldn't escape. Rey was being pulled into the LAAT by Anakin. He was very upset because up until this moment, she never showed any disregard for orders from anyone. There were things she disagreed with or even flat out hated, but she had never shown so much distaste for a direct order openly. She wiggled out of Anakin's grip and ran forward. There was an AAT tank rumbling forwards towards the clone position and she reached out with the force and used all of her strength to stop it. The droids were beginning to ferry themselves around the tank as the clones got up and started running. Anakin told the pilot to not take the ship off. The clone who were on the ship started laying down covering fire. The droids were confused while the tank stopped. Anakin ignited his lightsaber and got behind the clones as they got themselves up the hill and into the ship. Anakin yelled at Rey and told her it was time to go, and she in a fit of rage released a bundle of electricity which shot right into the tank and ripped it apart, creating a chain reaction that blew up droids and tanks behind it into pieces. Rey was shocked and so was Anakin, as they quickly ferried themselves into the ship. When they were in the LAAT, Anakin was telling her that he was very disappointed in her, but all she heard was white noise as she stared at her hands, which were visibly shaking from what she had just done. Anakin noticed that she wasn't listening, and decided to save it for later. When they got back to the flagship, she helped the wounded clone onto a stretcher. Anakin waited outside the LAAT with Rex. Once the clone was put onto a stretcher, he grabbed her forearm and thanked her. Rey nodded her head with a small smile, and he was pulled away. Rey looked down and then over at her master and walked up to him. She apologized for disregarding a direct order, and she accepted that she would likely be punished by the council for her actions. Anakin stopped and shook his head. He said that he understood why she did it, but he wasn't going to tell the council. This wasn't favoritism, this wasn't getting a pass, this was concern. Anakin didn't want the council to know that she just used the force in such a spiteful way. Truthfully, it made Anakin question his own teachings of Rey. There have been times where he used excessive force on a foe, and Rey was clearly not comfortable with it in the moment. So maybe it was a reflection of himself? Being that the Jedi and Anakin didn't know Rey's true lineage, for her to use a power like that really shocked him to say the least. Because of this, he especially didn't want the Council to know about it. He kept it hidden, and in the coming weeks, the Master and Apprentice duo would face their largest struggle yet. During the time, they spoke about it and explained that she shouldn't use the power. And while she agreed with him, expressing that she wanted no part of that power, she didn't know how she did it. That likely was the most concerning thing about it to Anakin. When he used the dark side, he was completely in control. When she used it, she had absolutely no control over it. A couple weeks after the incident, Anakin and Rey would be a part of the first leg of the Kato Nemodia campaign when they would be rushed back to Coruscant. The temple had been bombed, and through a series of unfortunate events, 
Ray was blamed. It didn't help that the Chancellor was made aware of her actions on the battlefront. Anakin told him because he needed an elder to confide in and he wasn't sure if Obi-Wan would accept what Ray just did. Turns out Sidious had been keeping an eye on Anakin and his new student for a long time. The few times Palpatine interacted with Ray, he could sense that she was related to him in some way, though the main concern for him was whether he was right or not. The lack of familial name was something that was a real hint that it was possible, but when she showed signs of force electricity of such magnitude, he knew it had to have been his blood. So he orchestrated the bombing of the temple, supplying Barriss Afi, the young radical, with the nanotechnology to bomb the temple. Barriss also used the dark side on the only potential witness while Ray was in a room with her. Ray tried to get the door open, and while she wasn't looking at the victim, she was still blamed by the ever so trigger happy Tarkin. Luckily for Ray, her master saved her from a potential death sentence at the hand of the executioner, which wasn't even going to happen with Grand Poppy Palpy around to save her. What a lucky draw. It did annoy Sidious, but he always had a plan in the making, and he would just move on to another plan, and so he didn't get too caught up on the one that nearly had his granddaughter placed right into his hands. For Rey, she always looked for a belonging, and she had it with the Jedi, and yet, it was just taken away from her. The Council offered an official apology, and at the age of 18, she, like her master, would become a knight. She obviously would be a year younger than he, but it was the only thing that the Jedi could leverage on her to stay within the Order for their mistakes. Rey didn't know what to do. For the first time since she was on the streets, she felt alone, and if it weren't for Anakin, she would have been dead. But she wasn't. The choice was hers. Anakin handed her Padawan braid and told her that they were asking her back. Rey had to hide tears. Despite being a Jedi, she was still greatly in tune with her emotions. It took her everything she had not to cry here in front of the council. Anakin's glove lay right before her, and she looked down at her braid. She placed her hand around his hand and decided at the last second to take the braid back into her hands. She pulled it from his hand and smiled. She thanked him and then bowed to the council before shuffling out of the room. She walked to the elevator and Anakin followed her. They entered it together and he told her that he was very proud of the bravery she displayed during the greatest trial of her life. She didn't say a word and burst into tears. Anakin put his arms around her and told her that she was okay now. The bond between Master and Apprentice had never been tighter than it was at this moment. She broke off the hug and wiped tears away from her face, as she told Anakin that if he hadn't been there for her, she didn't know where she would have been. Her sense of belonging was crushed, and he was the only person inside the Order who believed in her. Anakin understood, and he told her that he would never betray her. She was always in his corner. No matter what she asked, he told her, no matter what. Rey as a Jedi Knight could do as she pleased, and while she had been against the war for a long time, she was ready to bring it to an end, and that's what she prepared to do, by joining Anakin on the front lines again. The war was heating up, and Rey's skills were too. While she would never be as acrobatic as Ahsoka just due to the size difference between the two of them, she could become a better swordsman, which is exactly what she did. Anakin was impressed because Rey took a lot after her master. Her strikes weren't nearly as powerful, but she did make up for it with her speed. Anakin did suggest that she wield a double-bladed lightsaber, but she didn't want to. His suggestions were based on her adolescence with a staff, but she prepared the regular lightsaber. They fit her groove a lot more than a staff ever did. The staff was just a means for protection in the Undercity. The lightsaber was so much more to her than that. Rey continued with her master on the front lines, where she started showing more of that darkness that her master was exhibiting late in the war. That powerful Palpatine blood coursing through her veins only made her that much more of an opposing threat to the Separatists. On Ringo Vinda, she'd be responsible for saving Master Tiplar from Clone Trooper Top. She forced Porter before the Clone Trooper could shoot her in the back of the head. While it was a true save, Rey wouldn't accompany the clones to Kamino. She cared a lot about Tup, but she believed the entire situation could be handled by Rex and Fives. Obviously, it wasn't. The information obtained by Fives was lost to the Sith and to their master plan. Rey's journey as a knight would continue in a spiral of different directions. While on one hand she could exhibit these excessive shows of the dark side, she was also as gentle as a butterfly. She could never hurt any sentience, and she only showed the dark side when she was engaging with the droids. Anakin could see it, but because it wasn't Force Lightning, he was relatively okay with it. For the most part, he didn't do too much correction on her. Though their spars were getting more and more intense, they both played off each other extremely well. With both of them having such a high ceiling, they only made each other better, which was the biggest surprise for Skywalker. He knew the old legend that every master must be able to learn from their student, but he didn't realize that he would actually begin excelling because of his student. Her midichlorian count, despite being almost 10,000 off of his, was what played such a crucial part in it. While Anakin hadn't fully refined himself, Rey, like Plo and Obi-Wan, had. Rey spent so much time focused on refining herself during her younger years that once the time came for her to excel, it came rapidly. Anakin wasn't quite as refined, but his competitive nature brought it up. He simply refused to allow his student to beat him. He beat Obi-Wan a couple of times, but he refused, absolutely 110% refused to allow any student of his beat him. It didn't matter if it was Rey, if it was Grogu, if it was Ahsoka, it did not matter. No student of his would ever beat him. Until she did. 
It woke up its competitive nature, and they went at it. They trained unlike any duo the Order had ever seen, and when they weren't on the front lines or in meetings, their lightsabers were going at the speed of light against each other. The sight was incredible. They both played off of each other extremely well, and the intensifying of their spars only contributed to their effort in the war. The two of them were already the best duo at fighting in the war, but they only got better. There is also something that really solidified their bond between the former master and apprentice. The ingenuity. Both of them learned how to be a mechanic, at some degree, to survive. While Anakin was a slave, he mostly was given free time at the end of his days so he could build protocol droids and pod racers. Rey, on the other hand, had to learn to use what she scavenged. Because if she didn't, she couldn't eat. It made their dynamic a little hard when Anakin expressed his joy in mechanics, but she saw his optimism for it, and she was able to turn all those negative memories into positive ones. Not happy that they happened, but glad that she had those moments in her life, because without them, she wouldn't have been able to experience the time she now had with Skywalker. Anakin also taught her how to pilot as well. She had a couple simulators down the dumps, but they were close to 4,000 years old, so the piloting mechanics were either dysfunctional, reversed, which was a pain to deal with, or just not up to date. She had some experience with flying, but Anakin got her to really get her groove with piloting. Which when the Battle of Coruscant came around, Rey was dispatched to lead a fighter group, while Anakin and Obi-Wan saved the Chancellor, which inevitably would be a successful mission. Rey wouldn't see Anakin until after she learned he was placed on the High Council, though while she was looking for him, she couldn't find him. He was being put on a special mission that outraged him. After he learned of this mission from Obi-Wan, he found Rey in the training room. She was sparring against two of the available temple guards when Skywalker entered. They finished their match, and then the guards left the room so Rey and Anakin could speak to each other. Per Anakin's request, of course. She said she wanted to congratulate him on the new rank of honor. She mentioned that he always wanted to be on the council. He paused for a moment and smiled. He thanked her, but then a sadness fell over him. She could see it, and she asked what was bothering him. He told her that he was unsure if he could tell her or not, but she grinned and told him that she wasn't a snitch. Who would she tell? He was on the council. It got him to smile a little bit, and then he sat down and told her the instructions that were given to him. While Rey never liked the Chancellor, she almost marched herself into the council chambers because she knew how close her former teacher and Palpatine were. It upset her that the council would do this. Rey had found a bit of semblance of belonging that she wanted since the trial. But she was on edge with the council the entire time. She was unhappy with them, and this wasn't helping any case they could make for themselves. Rey asked Anakin what he wanted to do about it. He told her that he would do it, but he was reluctant. Rey told Anakin that he could just pretend that he was hanging out with Palpatine, and if he said anything sus, he could report it to the council. But he pretty much ended the war, no need to stress about it, right? Well, with Dooku dead, that was a fair point, and he appreciated her warmth towards him. He received more of that warmth with a greater amount when he came home to his wife later that day. The next day would have Kenobi departing for Utapau to fight General Grievous. It left Anakin more bereft than he was before. He didn't know what he was doing or what he was supposed to do. It didn't make sense, and he was afraid of his lack of control. While his wife was out, Anakin returned to the temple to speak with his apprentice again. This obviously wasn't to say that she knew more than him or that she was his therapist, but they had such a tight bond that he might as well take advantage of having her around. They were like siblings, and while he was a little upset about not being with Obi-Wan, the fact that Ahsoka was joining him on the mission made him feel a little bit more understanding. Ahsoka went head to head with Grievous more than once during the war, so she could be up for the challenge. The two of them sat on the steps outside the tree in the temple garden. Anakin was simply relaxing in his own way. It was hard to act like he wasn't concerned with Obi-Wan, but he was. Rey knew. She understood the bond, but she didn't comment on it. Sitting here on the outside with the tree was a simple need. It was the peace. They spoke about their paths and how being on one that seemed so riddled with adversity was difficult. But Rey reminded him of her trial. For better or worse, on the other side of that, she was a changed person. She believed that the trial made her a better Jedi and a better woman. She asked if he believed that to be true, and he agreed with her. She then asked if he thought that he'd be a better Jedi and a better man on the other side of this endeavor. He thought and nodded his head. He then asked if she could keep a secret for him. It was rhetorical, but she nodded her head. He told her about Palpatine telling him to execute Dooku on the Invisible Hand. Rey asked if he told the council, and Anakin shook his head. Well, that was something, wasn't it? Anakin said he believed it was a political thing, but at the same time, it was eating him up on the inside. He didn't know who to tell, Rey agreed, but not for nothing. Despite the execution, the war was closer to being over because of it. This was something he could agree to, too. He just didn't really know how to process it all. It all felt so wrong, but it was the right thing to do, right? She suggested that maybe from now on he not listen to politicians. He agreed to a degree, but his wife was one, so he kind of had to. He didn't say that out loud, but it was just more so an internal dialogue. Hours later, both of them would be inside the communications chamber, where they received word that Kenobi engaged General Grievous on Utapau. This was information given over by Ahsoka. She wasn't able to keep up with them, so she joined the clones. The reason she couldn't keep up is because Grievous ran away, and Obi-Wan had one lizard. 
Windu turned to Anakin and requested that he deliver the information to the Chancellor. Anakin nodded his head and turned to Rey, and she smiled at him in a reassuring way. A means to uplift his spirit, if you will. Before the fall of the sun, Anakin would return and be told to remain in the council chambers, which he did. He didn't tell Rey that he returned. He just kind of needed to be alone at the moment. That was a terrible idea. Rey could sense that he was in the temple, but could not find him. She just hoped that he was okay. She knew how tantalizing it could be for him, but it turns out finding out the man who was your mentor was actually a Sith was kind of a big deal, not to mention the whole grooming thing that Anakin completely forgot about. Rey was in the hangar bay working on her starship when she saw Anakin run past her. She almost called out his name, but she knew that he wouldn't hear her. He was so fixated, he jumped into a ship and lifted off. She quickly dropped her wrench and placed the panel back onto a starfighter and tried to start it. Oh no, the spark plugs. Panic ran through her as she frantically searched for them. She then had to pull the panel back off and then put the plugs back in to make sure the ship would start. Thank goodness it didn't. She then got around and put the panel back on and then realized she didn't know where she was going. The best she could do was the Republic Executive Building. It was the last place he went to. If he wasn't there, then she had no clue. Luckily for her, she was increasing the speed on her fighter, so it was essentially always in sports mode. She lifted off and was thrown to the back of her seat as a ship ripped through the hangar bay, throwing people from their feet. Oopsies, she'd be in trouble for that one. When she got to the executive building, she saw Anakin's vessel and dropped hers down next to it and jumped out. She ran as fast as she could to the Chancellor's office, where she could audibly hear someone screaming out of it. As she sped into the room, she could feel death and she ran into the office hearing Anakin let out a cry of what had he done. Rey slid into the room and saw Palpatine standing over Anakin, who was on his knees. She ignited her lightsaber and demanded that the Sith Lord step away from her master. Oh how perfect, a master and apprentice to turn to the dark side. Anakin was a prized pupil, but why not bring his granddaughter to the winning side? They'd be the perfect Jedi hunters, and the perfect lineage of the Sith. One to keep the other in line, a constant threat of replacement, just a way to keep their eyes focused on each other rather than him. He laughed and welcomed his granddaughter. Her brows creased and she held her lightsaber in front of her and demanded to know what he meant by that. His yellow teeth and his yellow eyes pierced the darkness of the room. He asked her if... She wanted to know what truly happened to her parents. Anakin looked over at a student. The choice was now even harder to make, but he didn't want to see Rey's fall from grace. She didn't deserve it. He couldn't abandon her as well, but he also couldn't let his wife die in childbirth. Anakin watched as cities walked forward, laughing as he did. He told Rey that he could reveal everything she ever wanted. She wanted to feel like she belonged, didn't she? Anakin was too stuck to say a word. He couldn't choose. He looked at his student, and she looked at her grandfather. He smiled and raised his hands. She knew it to be true. All this time, her family was right here. And now, it was a time to be what her parents could not. Rey wondered what that could mean, and he told her that she could be powerful. Her father was nothing. Not a skill in the force, not an ounce worth of anything. Nothing but a coward. Rey's anger began to rise. She may have not known them, but it was beginning to make a lot more sense why she was left alone on the lower levels of Coruscant. It was protected from a monster like Palpatine. He told her that the Jedi betrayed her. What she always longed for was right here with him. And they could be her true family. He was her true family. They could give her the belonging she always desired. Anakin cried out that he wouldn't let it happen to her, and he ignited his lightsaber and launched himself at Sidious, who very quickly shot lightning at Anakin. It was enough of a blast to throw him from his feet to the ground. Rey stepped forward, but she stopped. It was a trap. She could see it in Sidious's eyes. He told her to come with him, calling her granddaughter. She said she wouldn't. Sidious had no time for this. Skywalker would be turned. He already made the choice to turn. Sidious lifted his hand and from one of the vases in the room flew a crimson lightsaber. Just like her master would, Rey slid her shoulders to the side and the weapon sped Rey past her into her grandfather's hands. He told her that she would die a Jedi. She would die surrendering herself to people who betrayed her. Rey said she wouldn't die, but if she didn't, she would die making sure her master didn't betray himself. Sidious without missing a beat said, so be a Jedi before launching himself across the room. His blade slammed against hers, and she staggered. He was powerful, but all those days and years sparring with Skywalker added up. His skills with the blade outmatched her in every way, but she was prepared. Her defense got her to steady herself and control her breathing. Each moment full was a match against her grandfather. Their blades slammed together and lit up the room. The speed was remarkable, and Skywalker couldn't help but be proud of her in the moment. He may have trained her, but this was all her at this moment. She steadied herself back as she saw Anakin rise to his feet from behind Sidious and his lightsaber ignited. Rey smiled and said to her grandfather, she wasn't just any Jedi. Sidious was caught off guard by a face full of force lightning. The Dark Lord stumbled back and Anakin took a step forward with a power strike that cut Rey across Sidious's chest and dropped him to the ground. Rey looked at her master. Despite what she saw, she wanted to make sure he hadn't turned or anything. He extinguished his lightsaber and asked her how she knew where he was. 
She smiled and told him that she was in the hangar bay working on her ship when he ran by. Oh, of, co of course she was, of course. The two of them wrapped each other up in a massive hug. Anakin told her that he always had faith in her and thanked her for having faith in him. She smiled and said that she would always have faith in him. He was family to her. Anakin smiled and patted her on the shoulder before realizing they had a bit of a mess to clean up. She scratched her head and asked how they could do this. Anakin told her he had a friend that could do it. Anakin called Padme over and a couple of her other senator friends that were extremely close with Skywalker. They all would explain that Sidious attacked them and the Jedi defended them. If it weren't for Anakin and Rey arriving, then they would have been killed by a clearly corrupt politician. The senators defended the Jedi and expressed that they should publicly appreciate the Jedi who died in service of their lives. The lie was believable because, believe it or not, Palpatine was trying to set the Jedi up. All the security cameras were turned off. Luckily, Anakin had some good friends ready to serve alongside them to help them throughout. With the destruction of General Grievous and the capture of the Separatist Council thanks to Ahsoka on Utapau, the war came to an end. Anakin wouldn't reveal what actually happened inside the Senate building and his betrayal of Mace Windu, ever. Master Windu's dead body would be uncovered later. He was knocked out and landed on an antenna, which did end his life. Anakin felt immeasurable guilt for the death of Master Windu and began a journey on his own to make up for it. No matter the disagreements, Anakin never wanted Windu to die for them. It wasn't something he ever wanted for Mace, at all. Anakin's children would be born shortly after the entire ordeal inside the executive building. Anakin would thank Rey for being there with him in his most desperate hour and she told him that she would always be there when he needed her most. He appreciated this, which is why Rey was the first person to meet the infants, Luke and Leia. She couldn't help but be happy for Anakin and his little family. She expressed that she wished him the best on his journey away from the Order. He told her that he wasn't leaving the Order, and she was genuinely surprised. He told her that he would continue serving as a Jedi Master on the High Council, because he knew that one day, Rey would join him on that same Council. She thanked him, but she didn't believe that day would come. She never thought of herself worthy enough to be on the Council. Despite that, Anakin believed in her. He told her that he and Padme talked. Rey looked at them for a moment in a confused manner, and Anakin put his hand on Rey's shoulder. He told her that they would like her to be a member of their family. She was just as much a Skywalker as any of them. Rey's eyes watered and she asked if they believed that was true, and they both nodded their heads in synchronization. Tears slipped from her eyes and she apologized for crying and they both came up to her and embraced her. They told her that she had always been one of them. As she nestled her head on their shoulders, a massive smile formed across her face. She was home. Months would pass by and as she was known now as, Rey Skywalker would be presented with something she would have never seen coming. Anakin thought it would be a good idea to do what Yoda did to him, and he sprung a student on her, a young Twi'lek girl named Deja Numa. Just as everyone in the Order knew Anakin, everyone knew the apprentice who helped bring balance to the Force. Deja was so excited to be approached by Anakin first, but then presented to Rey. Of course, Rey was a little apprehensive, but Anakin reminded her that she would be alright. She was trained by him after all. She smiled and laughed as he walked away. Rey looked down at Daisha and thought of the most important question she could think of. What's your favorite food? Okay, maybe not that important, but it was the best she could come up with at the moment. Daisha was confused, but she smiled and told her new master what it was. Anakin turned back and watched Rey and Daisha walk in the other direction. Obi-Wan happened to be in the area, and he said it wasn't so bad having a student, was it? Anakin shook his head. Not a student. Family. He patted Obi-Wan on the shoulder and watched as the two of them walked down the hall. Years later, Rey would fulfill what her master believed she would. Daisha would become a Jedi Knight at the age of 19, and Rey would be welcomed into the High Council. Anakin used this as teasing material. Come on, Obi-Wan finished my training when I was 19, I finished your training when you were 18, you were supposed to finish Daisha's when she was 17. Rey had no clue. She didn't know she was a part of this game that they were playing. What a lineage for Qui-Gon though. Three Jedi that followed after him became council members, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Anakin Skywalker, and Rey Skywalker. The story didn't end there though. Rey would join Anakin on their missions to Naboo for family outings. What made it better was Luke and Leia as they had two people who could teach them how to use the Force proficiently. They both grew into exceptional Force users like their father and aunt, but they would never be a part of the Order. While Maul would escape on his own for a certain amount of time, he would never become a large threat. The Jedi Order, which helped reshape the Republic, would also reshape the Outer Rim, something that was a personal project for Jedi Master Anakin Skywalker. Rey, on the other hand, would begin cleaning up the lower levels of Coruscant. She felt a surreal amount of peace as she helped give children the peace that took her years to find. As the years went by, Anakin and Rey would continue their relationship and be seen as a forefront of the Jedi Order, leading the Order into a new era, one unseen in generations. 
And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Weewoo 670, Ozzy Tano, Rai Rai 700, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Johnny Nguyen, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Khaled, Youngling Slayer 66, Mad Manny Studios, Anakin 003, Fordo's Legacy Star Wars, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. If you like the video, smash the like button, go check out the Patreon, there's really cool things on it. I lost my voice. We're going to finish this with uh, talking about the video. As you probably noticed, I needed to put those in there in the video because I know the comments are already coming, but I don't care. Uh, I just, uh, this is, this is Ray. This is who she is. This is, I didn't change anything about her. The only thing I changed was what era she was born in. And that's it. I didn't change anything about her character. Her character is the same person. And that's why I love her. Ray's one of my favorite characters in all of Star Wars. And I, I don't usually get to write about her, which is probably why this video is so long. Uh, because the character means a lot to me, and and her optimism is something I find very inspiring. But it's it's so integral to her character, and so putting her with Anakin was something that was a lot of fun to do, but also something that felt like it needed to feel like a movie. It needed to feel drawn out because I know I'm not going to change opinions. I know I'm not going to change hearts, but maybe I can change perceptions, and that might just be enough. But I'm creating stories, and that's what I want to do at the end of the day. Whoever it is, whether it's Anakin, Ray, or someone from the High Republic or an era after Ray, I don't care who it is. It's all about creating Star Wars stories, and that's what it is to me, because I love this franchise with all of my being. I love it to death. I don't care who it is. I just do. I love Rey, I love Ezra, I love Revan. I don't care who it is. I love I love Star Wars, and that's why this video is here. So anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all. Spread the love, and always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.